You're listening to Forward, a podcast from faculty at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, hosted by Michelle Knight, Josh Jipp, Madison Pierce, and James Arcadi. Forward invites listeners into the mission of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School through conversations with faculty, staff, and guests. Madison, hey, it's good to see you today. How's it going? It's good, James. How are you doing? I'm doing just great, thanks. Good. Well, so on Twitter the other day, we posted about New Year's resolutions. and We did. Yeah, we're into January at this point. I was kind of wondering, Mm. how are you doing? Drinking lots of water? You know, I'm hydrating. I really, I really am. You know, I I had set the resolution to drink a full glass of water. And then Josh jumped on to Twitter and said that he actually drinks, I think it was a full 20 ounces, which was more than I was anticipating. So I I took that challenge <laughs> and I upped myself to 20 ounces because Josh Ship does 20 ounces. And I've got to say, I haven't missed a day so far. Hey, that's pretty good. Yeah, I think I mentioned on Twitter. Nope. So I keep I keep this by my bed. Whoops. And basically I like have it very full at at night and it is the case that sometimes I drink it through the night. Like if I wake up in the middle of the night and I feel kind of parched or something like that and I wake up and I have like this much left, but usually I chug it in the morning. So. Are you, are you so healthy that you can actually consume water in your sleep? You're like doing two (laughs) things at once. You're like hydrating and you're getting rest. Now that's, that's, that's upper level self-care. No, but I, we are a thirsty people. I, my my dad drinks a lot of water. Isla drinks a lot of water. I, I mean, I'm just always drinking, and so um, and and I often feel dehydrated if I don't. So it's it's kind of weird. I mean, I, I'm not like uber healthy or anything like that. I just feel like like that's what my body needs for whatever reason. So I don't know. Hey, yeah, I'm into it. Now, your um, remind me what your New Year's resolution was. I think it was a little bit more serious than than mine. I think it was more like being a better human being or something like that, not just drinking water. <laughs> not remotely. Um, but it was really funny to me that it seemed like I had like I had taken this very seriously. It, normally, I would just kind of write something quickly or whatever. Everyone else wrote like a sentence or something, and I was like, "How is how is this that I'm the serious one? I just can't imagine." Um, but yeah, so I had two. One was to do um, hmm. to improve my Spanish because um, hmm. I, you know, I've been wanting bueno. to. Yeah, I've been wanting to for a while. Um, but you know, we we're our church is located in a neighborhood with um, a large Hispanic population, and I tried to use mm-hmm. my Spanish with some uh, locals one uh, day that I was there, and I figured out that my Spanish is even worse and and more rusty than I remembered. Um, but it's also the case that Isla loves Spanish. She's super into it. She keeps mm. asking me what things are called, and she actually means like, "What is the Spanish word for this?" And so um, our two year old is like into it. Um, she Curtis jokes that she knows more Spanish than he does, and although he's joking, <laughs> he may actually <laughs> that may actually be true. <laughs> he may not be joking. <laughs> yeah, it's like a subtle whatever. But the other one, and I think this is the one that um, that you will find a little funny is that, um, my other resolution is to be more structured (laughs) and I'm really surprised that no one has said, really, Madison, you want to be more structured, (laughs) but it would be a fair, fair thing to say. I, I, I can't personally being a rather unstructured person, I can't imagine being more structured than, well, I can't imagine being more structured than I am and I'm unstructured. So, (laughs) Yeah, that's my, so that's my thing. My my way of structuring is like setting aside chunks of time for certain things. Like mm. once the semester starts, I do really poorly at prioritizing just sitting and reading. It's like just mm. picking up a monograph and like reading it straight through and stuff like that. And um, I really think it's an important practice. And so um, I've yeah. carved out, you know, an hour to an hour and a half a day. Like that's what I do as I read. And what's interesting is. Um, although you might think like, well, then how in the world do you get anything else done? But certainly with my writing, if I set aside reading time, then the shorter writing time is far more productive because I actually have things going into my brain and out of my brain. So I don't know. That's what mm. I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, hey, that's cool. I mean, 
you do you, as we say, or as someone <laughs> says, I guess. But I think I think saying. that's that that's great, and we'll we'll check up on you a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll we'll ask you about how uh, you have to respond in Spanish as to how structured your life is these days. <laughs> yeah, and I don't and think I'll, I can. Say I'll that just yet. drink some water. <laughs> Mas agua. Um, yeah, so we're about to jump into a conversation <laughs> with President Perrin. Um, I did want to give yeah. a slight disclaimer. So my internet is terrible today. So if I, I'm, I may interrupt uh, Dr. Parent and Dr. Arcadi. So y'all forgive me out there, mm. forward listeners. So. It, we'll, we'll make do whatever work, whatever happens. That's how we All roll right. here forward. Thanks, James. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Forward, a TED's faculty podcast. I'm James Arcadi. And I'm Madison Pierce. We are delighted to have a very special guest with us here today, the uh, the fearless leader of Trinity International <laughs> University, uh, the one uh, where at Trinity the buck and the denarius stops, the captain of the good ship Trinity, uh, a man who is equally comfortable, I think, parsing Greek verbs and benching 225, the 16th president of Trinity International University, Dr. Nicholas Perrin. What an intro, thank you. Wow. Well, we're so excited to have you with us here, Dr. Perrin. And um, I mean, in some sense, you might be uh, the guest who needs the least introduction to the Trinity community, but I wonder if you might just share a little bit about, maybe about your life kind of coming, uh, prior to coming to Trinity, what particularly interested you, maybe in joining academia, and just a little bit about your, your background bio. Sure, sure. So I, I grew up in New Jersey and uh, grew up in a secular home, essentially. So to this day, my parents will declare themselves agnostics, although I think they are drawing near the kingdom after many, many years of prayer. Mm. Um, and so that was that was just God was not really on the table at all. But I sensed my uh, coming up to high school that there was something missing. Mm. And I went to boarding school and I started searching, um, started reading. I, I just thought, like, maybe the answer is in books somewhere. I started reading about religion, um, started reading about Zen Buddhism, started practicing Zen, but also started uh, parsing Greek for the first time because I was taking mm. Greek. And uh, that was my first entry into the Bible. So uh, my, the first time I ever read the Bible, it was Mark chapter one uh, in the Greek mm -hmm. and one verse at a time. So wow. eventually I got an English Bible and came to Christ through the Navigators my sophomore year at Johns Hopkins, and then uh, got into campus ministry. But before, while I was at Johns Hopkins, though, I, I, I thought I was on the track of going into academia because I had some professors who just had, had a profound impact on opening up vistas of understanding liberal arts and so on and so forth. Um, and I thought, well, gee, wouldn't that be cool? So. It was a bit of a struggle, whether to go into ministry or whether to go into academia. And now, lo and behold, I'm a little bit of both. So it was it was kind of like a liberal arts like uh, entrance into both like the faith and studying the Bible. Is that kind of how it? Yeah, came that, I mean, I, I came to Christ my sophomore year of college at Johns Hopkins University. I was in the English department at the time. Hopkins had one of the leading English departments in the country. Big Stan Fish was there. Um, you know, I, I had the medieval guy, uh, uh, Lee Patterson, and just, you know, the ability to how he handled the text um, was, uh, was such an inspiration to me. And just um, I really felt that somehow I was going to end up with a life of learning. But I also just had a passion for ministry. Um, and after I came to Christ, I, I just I, God gave me his heart for evangelism, for sharing the gospel, for making disciples and you know, eventually God brought me to a place where I could do both. Mm, that's cool. Now, and I know you've done a bit of work on like the historical Jesus and New Testament. Was it uh, was it that kind of like entrance into just kind of studying Greek and studying the New Testament in Greek that led to that particular area of study? Or was there, was there something else? You know, I think so. From, OK, so I did uh, campus ministry for eight years. Um, the last three of those years, I was doing my MDiv, did some some work at Trinity. End up getting my full MDiv at a Covenant Theological Seminary, and uh, then was in the pastor for th a couple of years. I, I came in coming to my life at that time. We had our first kids, and she just said, "You know, you, I think you should 
uh, work on a doctorate because you just seem to gravitate toward that kind of stuff. And, you know, not knowing what she was getting herself into. Uh, so I went up to Marquette and I was going in really interested in Paul, um, but then ended up with the Gospels. And I, I wrote on the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas was this kind of hot new commodity. And I just so I just want to figure this thing out. And it was still early on the Gospel of Thomas discussion. So I got in on that at a, a you know, at a good time, um, interesting time. And uh, yet uh, working on Thomas really put me in gospel studies. So I guess, I, was it, in, sorry, in, sorry in, the, in the gospel of Thomas, just on that particular point right there, I mean, kind of what was the, I mean, it was a hot button issue in academia at the time there, but did you yeah. see that as intersecting in kind of your own thinking about the Gospels themselves or the historical Jesus, or maybe what gravitated you to that particular area? Well, yeah, I, I think with the historical Jesus piece, I think to me, I, I got interested in that um, partially through, and this is going to be true for a lot of scholars who write on the historical Jesus today, especially the evangelical stripe, uh, through reading Tom Wright's Jesus and the Victory of God. And, um, you know, with his kind of careful engagement with, alternative voices and, and uh, scholars from the Jesus Seminar. I thought that was just a really fascinating conversation that I want to be part of. And I felt like he was, he, he did so much in that book that, it, but it really had more heuristic value than anything to kind of like the hardcore payoff. So anyway, I, I just felt like now that's a conversation I, I wouldn't mind coming back to. Uh, the, the difficult about historical Jesus study stuff is really methodological, and it, mm. it can be so methodologically overwrought that it's hard to write for multiple audiences. Because on the one hand, the scholars want you know about four chapters of methodology before they listen to you, but then you know your lay readers, lay, lay readers are like, you know, they're, they're not going <laughs> to sit through all that. But I, I think it's to me the historical Jesus is important not because we get theology from the historical Jesus. I think we get theology from the canonical gospels, both you know as unitary works and also as a kind of fourfold canon um, within a canon. But because historical Jesus is part of the background, as say archaeology would, or the you know how much was a denarius worth, and a pretty important part of the background. So we so to the extent that our re gospel research has to be responsible to history. We can't just treat Jesus like a no-fly zone. I know like some scholars like to do that, and they're like, oh, we can't know Jesus, so let's not talk about him or talk about his aims or whatever. But that, but that just seems to me ultimately docetic. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, either he was human and, and had, like, cognitive processes like the rest of us and was trying to actually do something when he flipped over tables in the temple, you know, or it was just like one kind of bizarre, uh, you know, blip on history. So I, I tend to believe the former. Super helpful. I don't know, James, if you want to follow up with a systematics question, you're, you're pro no, this is probably piquing your interest talking about the incarnation and everything, but yay and amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll, we'll stick with research for, for a minute. Um, President Perrin, I I'm interested. I mean, um, it is sort of rare for evangelicals, as you say, to do good, um, historical Jesus research, um, so why is that? And, you know, maybe why do you feel like this is an important um, avenue or kind of sub-discipline for evangelicals to be engaged? Yeah, it is true. There's not many evangelicals who go into it. I, okay, and I think the evangelicals who do go into it um, historically over the past, say, 30 years have done, done so from an apologetic point of view. So kind of case by case, salvage job on one pericope at a time. Here's why it's historical. Which is which is useful, um, but I, I think on the left, scholars would say, well, that's kind of fairly predictable and and feels tendentious. And um, and then w how do we really do anything constructive with that? Except, and is this just a way of kind of ending up with a canonical Jesus again? Um, so <laughs> I, I think we need to do the careful spade work about thinking about, you know, the really difficult epistemological issues, like how do we know? Like, how do we know this is historical on what basis do we make that claim? And I think that's always a conversation worth having. I think we're, we're kind of at an impasse, though. And so part of what I'm interested in is, is trying new avenues of talking about Jesus and what he was up to um, outside the typical categories. And I think, I think it needs to be done, again, because if 
if in evangelicalism we treat his world Jesus as this kind of no-fly zone, I do think we end up with kind of docetic, implicit docetic Christology, where we say, oh, we can't really know about that stuff. So um, we, we'll just work with the idea of the, of the cross or the idea of the resurrection. Yeah, great. Thanks. Oh, yeah, James, you, you could feel free to shoot me down as a systematist. I, I don't know. <laughs> but that's, no, no. that's my <laughs> theological hunch. No, I think it's good. I think these are good. These are good things. And I appreciate the being able to, you know, see the theological implications for the work that's being done and trying to see those, you know, disciplines as working with each other and, and, and what have you. I think that's I think that's great. Um, you know, I, I guess, as I understand some of the way you've um, been thinking about your writing on the historical Jesus is it's, it's been kind of a trilogy or it's kind of a trilogy that you're sort of focusing in on uh, here, um, like many good works of uh, writing out there in the world. I wonder if you might be, could give us a little bit of an overview or a sort of precy of, of, the, of, of that work and the kind of the shape that that's taking for your own thinking. Well, sure. So I wrote Jesus the Temple a long time ago. Like, so that, that came out in 2010. Um, and Jesus, the Jesus of the Temple is where I make the initial argument that the historical Jesus uh, considered his own body um, sacred territory, and then by extension, the space he occupied. And the, and Jesus, the priest, which is the, the sequel to that, um, is really the kind of the logical next step is if if Jesus' body is sacred space, do we go on to say that he had Acquired priestly functions, and of course, I argue he did. And then, you know, I'm not going to go like to the six series of Star Wars or anything, but we'll stop at three, and then just say Jesus the sacrifice. Um, it's going to, you know, go into and and here's where I'm going to like need you theologians to kind of bounce off on is, um, you know, the idea of atonement. And what what did Jesus have in mind? What were his categories when he's thinking about atonement, uh, and how did all that work? So. If I can follow up, oh. I mean, I, I no, can't please, let a, please, a, a conversation like this go without some kind of Eucharistic connection, at least, or, or at least sort of baiting a Eucharistic connection. Yeah, do you, do you totally. see that playing out there, you know, in a totally. sort of systematic fashion? I mean, I, I think most, I think a good chunk, I, I anticipate a good chunk of the book is going to be focused on the Lord's Supper. Um, and I, I just find that moment with the disciples fascinating uh, for so many reasons. and. Um, you know, what's interesting to me is, okay, so the, and the, you have to create, have the extra step of saying, okay, we got what the gospel writers say. What can we reconstruct about what actually happened? And I think what you can get to is Jesus do some kind of equation between the bread and himself. You know, uh, this bread, like it was an Aramaic, this bread, I, this bread, me, you know, without the, since the Aramaic doesn't have a, a linking verb. Um, <clears throat> And and then he breaks it, and in in some ways, I think what's and I'm going to do things to jump to theology here, but in some ways, what's striking to me in that moment is Jesus is breaking the bread, identifying with the bread, and then having them eat it. He's almost asking the disciples to participate in his identity as broken, mm -hmm. and I, I think it's an afikoman. man. I think it's the the bread that's set apart for the Messiah. I, Mm. Um, some scholars will say that's, um, you know, anachronistic because our earliest dating for that is uh, toward the end of the first century. Um, I would make I would make a, a, a plausible argument for the he's identifying with the Afikum and that is the bread set aside for the Messiah. He by saying calling himself that bread, he is the Messiah and he's the broken Messiah. And that defines his ministry. Mm. I love it. I can't wait. Well, yeah, and then with all kinds of engagement with James, the kind of work you're doing. So, you know, I'm not sure how that will plan out. You know, we got to get COVID to end, so I actually have time to work on some of this. Yeah. Uh, well, and obviously, um, talking about Jesus and cultic ministry is right up my alley, uh, talking about Hebrews, um, because I think that what you're seeing in the Gospels is what's so explicit in Hebrews. Yes. And so I, I, you know, I obviously don't think that the author of Hebrews has pulled this idea of Jesus as priest out of thin air. And I think that what you've done in your work is to show that there's a there are even more plausible connections. I mean, people have picked up on hints before of Jesus's priestly ministry and all of that, but um, what you're doing is is showing that that was pre, you know, it was prior. 
Um, and then the other thing that you do that's so interesting is um, is show how we can conceive of David as a priest. And that's mm-hmm. something that I would love for our listeners to hear a little bit more about. If you don't mind us doing a little bit of a deep dive, can you tell us a little bit about David as priest? Sure, sure. Yeah. And and boy, we could just talk about Hebrews. And I mean, I think he, if there's a center of the New Testament theology, it's probably Hebrews. Um, so let just for the record. OK, um, but. Uh, as far as David, the, the, the priest goes, um, I, you know, you, if you read the David cycles carefully, you know, especially in second Samuel six, David builds a tabernacle, he blesses the people, he performs a sacrifice, and then he wears the ephod and that, which is really a technical term for being the priest. So he takes on all these roles that are distinctively and indeed uniquely priestly uh, we all know the story about Abiathar and the bread and, and, you know, we're all, everyone's trying to scramble and say, well, uh, was David really supposed to eat the bread? Uh, what happened with that? And maybe he was really hungry. And so God said, you know, it's okay if you're really hungry, which is just nonsense. I mean, David was a priest and he had right to the bread, but uniquely so, I shouldn't say uniquely so, the other king that falls in that category is Solomon. Now, that's, that presents a real puzzler because when we think about the concepts of, of kingship and priesthood in uh, Israeli history, we have these outliers of David and Solomon. Um, the way, like, why, why are they able to perform priestly duties? And then it's verboten for just about everybody else. Um, the way I resolve that is because I'm pretty convinced, and this, this piece, I don't write so much about in my book, Jesus the Priest, but boy, I would love to elaborate on it someday, is because they are unique in redemptive history in that they, they, were, all, they were the only kings that ruled over the United Kingdom. And so they could they can converge both the, the royal role and the priestly role together because there was 12 tribes worshiping in one place um, under one king. And for whatever reason, once the wheels come off on all that, where you, you have the dispersion of the tribe, the northern and southern kingdom, and then multiple worship sites, which is ultimately a compromise of monotheistic faith, right? So, so the, the, to me, the, this is this circles back to David. When you read texts like Ezekiel and Ezekiel thirty-four to thirty-seven, and other, you know, lots of other old prophetic texts about the tribes coming back together. Um, and especially in Zechariah, the, the main deal is the reunification of Israel and of the 12 tribes. It's not just that, hey, we got the property back. Isn't that cool? It is that. Uh, and that's not unimportant, but it's this this one one people for one God. Um, and, you know, the Shema is compromised until the return from exile comes back in full. Mm. Um, so David's main significance, I argue, is not that he rules politically. That's a means to an end. The mean, he, he needs the political power in order to exert sacred, uh, sacral power mm-hmm. so that he can be the real priest. And you, you read texts like Sirach, um, that's exact, exactly the point the writer's trying to make with, with Simon, is that not that he's essentially the king, which he was, but that he was the priest. That was a more kind of edgy claim that someone could make in the first century and that he's the proper high priest. How do you get there by being king? But kingship is a means to the end of exerting priesthood, not the other way around. And the reason I think the, we've got ourselves in a little bit of mess here, maybe we, because of the scholastic distinctions with the triple office, prophet, priest, and king. And we got to be really careful not to think of these as silos because, you know, Moses was clearly, I mean, Psalm 99 says Moses was a priest. He was clearly a king. You know, when he was up at Sinai, Jewish tradition will say he essentially became a king there. Um, and then, um, what am I missing here? Well, he's also a prophet. So, so yeah, there, yeah. right, right. So, so the thing is, we have these like, well, what, you know, here's Jesus being a prophet and priest and king and whatever. And the way I think that's boiled down into a lot of Protestant um, thought is, well, the priest is what he did on the cross, and that's it. Mm. Right. Rather than thinking of its priesthood in more holistic terms. And here's why it's important, I think, theologically, is because if the cross remains kind of an isolated priestly work it and with, and not being attached to his whole life, I think that that's a theological problem. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's, you know, you, you, you essentially don't know what to do with Jesus's life. But mm-hmm. I think an account that basically says he was priestly from the beginning to end, you know, from um, cradle to, to the ascension and beyond, that, that helps us out on a lot, on a lot of levels. Yeah, I think I yeah. think that's I think that's no, really rich. Think... And oh, go ahead, please, Madison. No, no, I was just going to say we may have to talk more about how that fits with Hebrews because there's there's a current debate right now about whether Jesus is a priest on earth in Hebrews, and so that that does raise some some questions. So, but we'll okay. nerd out about that. So you're with time. me on that one, though, Madison? <laughs> go ahead, huh? James. Sorry. All right. Oh, I don't know. I think Hebrews Hebrews says that he can't be a priest on earth. So because he's not a Levite, but, but I, I think that there's some wiggle room there. I think he doesn't make an offering on earth. And so he, I think that there's the kind of an already, or I don't want to bring in inaugurated eschatology, mm-hmm. but that, um, I think he is identified as someone who will be a priest. And I, th- I think that allows him to kind of do these different things, but I think it's really important to Hebrews that he does this kind of offering in heaven. So <laughs> But, yeah, very again, comfortable we'll have to that. Nerd out about that and, and I time, think that's probably. actually, I know James, you want to get in, but I think the son of man business with it. So one, one of the chapters in Jesus, the priest, I talk about the son of man and um, I go with the interpretation It's minority interpretation, which says Jesus essentially becomes the son of man in a process. Um, so he's saying that son of man, he's not first and foremost talking about himself. Now, it's going to sound scandalous. The president of Trinity is saying the son of man is not Jesus. It's not what I mean. He, he's saying, you know, that guy in Daniel chapter seven, that's the son of man. And I'm going to become him by the, the things I do. And I will kind of come into my fullness in that priestly role. So uh, Madison, I'm with you. I think that it's not like, oh, you know, it's like on and off switch. There's a sense in which he ramps up and realizes his priestly office um, in process. What? I think that's totally cool. And I was just going to um, offer another sort of point of systematic theology to like as a conjunction here, something I've been thinking about which is having to do with the, the image of God from, you know, from Genesis and thinking about our theological anthropology. And, and, and we've uh, seen an interpretation of the Imago Dei being this functional interpretation, but I've been, you know, pondering whether or not we can have like both, both a royal functional interpretation and a, a sacerdotal or, or priestly functional mm-hmm. interpretation. And so, and I would see those two as, as coalescing and I was seeing right. it as coalescing in Jesus I hadn't thought about seeing it coalesce in, in David as well, but I think that's a really, you know, provocative point and, you know, one that is more grist for my mill, I suppose, in thinking about theological anthropology. So, cool. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Boy, we could go on for hours yeah, on this and, stuff. And, oh, yeah. And in Second Temple literature, you definitely see Adam uh, or like a return to like an Ed- Edenic state. Um, yeah. as a, a big highlight because Adam is, is certainly envisioned as a priest. So I think that's, that's not just a Jesus David thing, but I mean, it's from the beginning. So totally yeah. right. So wherever you see Adamic Christology, you could argue, I mean, I think that's what's going on in, in Luke chapter three with the genealogy, son of, son of God, son of David, mm. I mean, son of, you know, Adam, son of, Adam, son of God. And then he, he's the baptism in a sense is c- basically conferring on him Adamic type status. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I love the the academic uh, conversation here, and this is really rich and, and, and insightful as, as well. Uh, I wonder, just maybe shifting gears a little bit. I mean, clearly you, you're an accomplished scholar. You've been doing a lot of teaching, a lot of writing over the course of your career. And, and then you've, you've had this move in the last couple of years into university leadership and administration. I'm just kind of curious about how that came about, just your openness to that kind of a move. How does that fit with your past work and sort of what your vision is for moving as a, you know, as a scholar, teacher, writer into, into leading an uh, institution like Trinity? Yeah, great question. You know, um, I, I was a pastor first. So when I, and I, my first job out of college was campus minister and then I have pastor. So those are, those are obviously leadership roles. Mm. And when I went into academia, I, I, I always found myself pastoring here or there, either as a temporary pastor or as a preaching pastor. And so that was always kind of, I always felt like that was a necessary component. And, and for three years, I was a chaplain, at assisted living home. And, um, and that was actually, it just felt like such a key piece. And, but always like in a leadership role. And, you know, and then 2010, my wife and I started a not-for-profit. And, and then 
that that so the leadership piece and the starting something new piece has always kind of been in my wheelhouse. Mm. Um, when in 2012, just through actually a weird chain of circumstances, I be, I became like not that weird, but I became dean of the of the grad school at Wheaton and did that for five years and really enjoyed it and just really enjoyed moving vision forward. And I think, you know, what jazzes me about scholarship is similar to what jazzes me about administration and, and a higher ed leadership. And I think what I really like about scholarship is a chance to be creative, to, to, to like see new patterns in the same old data, to be constrained by data, like you just can't make stuff up. Um, but to see things that people haven't seen before, and maybe actually it works. And I think higher ed is in such a place where actually we have to do really similar things, where um, we know that God's given us this mission to educate uh, men and women, to engage in God's redemptive work in the world. That's what we do at Trinity. But the old models are really being challenged by disruptions, and the pandemic has really accelerated that disruption. I don't think the pandemic is actually bringing a new reality as so much as moving us much more quickly to uh, to Zed, and then we have to figure out what to do from there. So what um, I think what we have is this, we have to be data driven in our decision making, but it's a time to really be creative. And um, and you know what I really I enjoy that piece and. Um, and there's a pastoral piece to it too. So that's kind of how I connect that's the threads excellent. there. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, so you and I, President Perrin, we started, I think, within like a month of each other here at TEDS. And that means that both of us have the distinctive privilege of having our first year at Trinity. Um, or, Ooh. you know, for me back at Trinity, uh, marred by the pandemic in some way. I think we should definitely get some kind right. of patch or something. Um, yeah, really. And as you've said, I think that it is kind of apocalyptic. You know, COVID has um, has revealed so much of what was already there. Um, I, I wonder, I, we, we're probably acutely aware of all the difficulty that has come in this, but I wonder, what are some of the things that COVID has done that will shape us for the better? Some of the things that will push us in good directions, at least in your opinion, this, this can be in society more broadly or Trinity, whatever, whichever way you want to take the question. Well, yeah, great question. I, and I think, I think in educational sector, um, you know, we educators tend to be very conservative in the sense that we can be, we really get really attached to certain modes of pedagogy. And oh, this like, you know, I had a favorite podium and this was the like dry erase marker I'd always use and like no, nothing. And we, we can say, uh, but I can't imagine teaching any other way, right? Without my dry erase marker. Well, what COVID has done is actually disrupted us to the point where we're forced to teach, you know, synchronously or different ways. Some faculty, even Trinity have never you know taught that way before. And then found out it wasn't so bad. And actually, there's there's some advantages, uh, there's some disadvantages, but it's it's not the end of the pedagogical world. And so that so that it forces us to be uh, more flexible. And I think that flexibility is going to be necessary to go into the future, because you know, um, it, it, like the thing about the future is we just don't know what it's going to look like. But I do know this: is we have to be flexible, and and figuring this out. Like, how do we continue with our mission? Yeah going forward. So I, I appreciate uh, the pandemic for that. I also think, you know, the pandemic is almost like a test of character in some ways. And for some people, it's, um, you know, with the ice, maybe it's this partially result of the isolation. It's um, made people more uh, insensitive to other people. Mm. or actually revealed insensitivities. But I think for a lot of us, it's like, you know, it, it, I'm sure that each of you have had the experience where you're approaching someone you haven't seen for a while, and you don't know, is does this person bump elbows? Does this person want to stand at 10 feet from you? Like the awkward kind of COVID greeting, like figuring each other out. And, and what that does kind of on a kind of personal level is makes, heightens your sensitivity to, to other people just on one-on-one -on -one encounters and like what they're comfortable with. Um, like, you know, we all try to be safe at, at Trinity, but it's, and, but everyone's on a different spectrum in terms of their, you know, comfort level. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that's actually, you know, what Christ calls us to is just always be thinking about the other person and what makes them comfortable, not what makes you comfortable. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's great. I mean, 
maybe just looking in your crystal ball a little bit, or maybe not even, you know, the details, but looking to the future, what are some things you kind of, you kind of hope for, for TEDs uh, specifically, or Trinity International University in, in general? What, what do you kind of hope for the future for us? Yeah, well, I think, I think one thing that I really hope for the, for the future is that we could do more to, to bring like this great TEDs experience that you guys are part of and partially responsible for to the world. And well, we know that the world's coming to us. You know, one of every five of our TED students is international, and that's great. But think of all the countless uh, people, uh, internationals who would love to be TED students, but just don't have the resources for that. How can we um, come to them? How can we like, like bring this great education that you guys bring to them uh, without, in the least, you know, you know, diminishing the quality? I think we can do that. I think God's calling us to do that. I think the North American market is really changed radically in the past 15 years. And I think it's God's email to us to say, hey, why don't you think more about outside of, of the traditional like North American market? Oh, that's great. I, I mean, I'll say, let me say one more thing. And I think no, it has please. to do with in order to really bank on that, we have to do we just have to be better on diversity. Um you know, uh, and that has to do with ethnic diversity, racial diversity, gender diversity. Um, and we, we, are, we just have to keep working at that. And, and I see uh, encouraging signs, but we have not arrived. Yeah, I think that's great. That's a great, it's a great vision. It's a hopeful vision for on a number of those points there. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, uh, President Perrin. Thanks so much for speaking with us today. It's been a, a pleasure to, to chat about uh, uh, academic stuff as well as the uh, you know the personal stuff and the professional stuff as well. So thanks very much. All right, guys. Thanks for just this, this show and everything you do. So appreciative of you on so many levels. Thanks for oh, having thank me on you. the show. Thanks for joining us. Oh, absolutely. Okay. But that's, Thank you. But that's just the foreword. So do be sure to check out President Perrin's numerous publications, uh, which you can find listed on his bio page on the TIU website. Uh, you can also check out some of Dr. Perrin's wonderful chapel sermons on our YouTube channel, the Trinity YouTube channel. Um, we're, so we're very grateful to President Perrin for taking the time to chat with us today. We're uh, grateful to our phenomenal producer, Curtis Pierce, uh, our unflappable graduate student, uh, Lauren Januzic. And we're especially grateful to you, our listeners, who join us uh, so often here on the podcast and on social media. I'm James Arcadi. And I'm Madison Pierce. Thanks, everyone. Forward is a podcast hosted by faculty at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. You can subscribe to our newest episodes on your preferred podcast app or at forwardpodcast.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Forward Podcast to get updates and additional links to content. Trinity Evangelical Divinity School is located 25 miles north of Chicago, with extension sites across the country and online. Trinity educates men and women to engage in God's redemptive work in the world by cultivating academic excellence, Christian faithfulness, and lifelong learning. You can find more information at teds.edu.